So thank you so much for having me out and doing this talk. Um, I I'm really excited to talk to you about something that I'm really excited about. So um, my name is Sarah Hamilton. I'm the Restoration Project Coordinator for Marion Soil and Water Conservation District. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about caring for your riparian areas. So I sort of based the talk on um, kind of urban areas, but a lot of the information is good for both urban areas and rural areas. And we're gonna talk a lot about the issues that are impacting streams in our area and what you can do about it. So let's begin. Uh, the first question, what is a riparian area? So um, riparian zones are the interface between land and flowing water. The plant assemblages and communities in riparian zones are influenced by the seasonal fluctuations of water. So the riparian zones are, are really the, the areas that are influenced by stream water. And for this presentation, I'm including the, the aquatic areas in the stream as well as the, the land adjacent to the streams. And as we go along, I'll pause every once in a while at the end of a section and give you a chance to ask questions. You can either type questions into the chat box or you can ask them out loud. Um, so why are riparian areas important? Just to start off with, in the US, riparian areas comprise less than 1% of the land area, but they're some of the most productive lands in our state and in, in the country. Um, healthy riparian areas filter water, absorb excess nutrients, reduce sediment in streams. They supply food, cover, and water for a diversity of animals. Uh, diver they, the diverse vegetation stabilizes stream banks and slows flood water, resulting in less erosion and infiltration and filtration and uh, more infiltration and filtration and riparian areas provide important connections to nature through recreation and aesthetic values. And so they, they, have, they play a lot of important roles in our environment. I think this became really obvious a, a few years ago when the city of Salem had to, um, had the, the, um, the bacterial overgrowth in the water system that made it so they could, couldn't drink the city water. And so it, keeping these healthy riparian areas has a huge impact, not just on wildlife, but on the people as well. And I wanna talk just a little bit about stream morphology. Uh, streams usually begin, and you can look at this, this picture is a great example of this. Streams usually begin really high in the hills and they capture surface water as it moved da moves downhill. They'll also include subsurface and groundwater depending on how they formed. Um, and, and these steep areas, water moves quickly. It moves uh, soil and debris and rocks downhill and it carves a channel by carrying soil, carrying that soil down in, into the lower channel or lower streams. Uh, when the water reaches the valley bottom, it slows down and those materials begin to settle out. The deposition of materials and the slowing of water creates meanders and floodplains along the water course. Most urban areas are along those lower and slower stretches of the stream, which is where we are at in Salem. So it's a process and you can see that erosion happens throughout the, the stream uh, cycle but that we as humans can increase the erosion significantly. And we'll talk more about that later. So what are the, health, what are the elements of a healthy riparian area? In-stream structures and diverse channel morphology, clean, clear, cool water, relatively stable banks and channels, and diverse, healthy native vegetation are what make our streams and riparian areas healthy. The threats to riparian areas in our area include channel simplifi simplification and loss of in-stream habitat, water pollution, erosion, and invasive plants. Those are the ones that we're gonna talk about. There's many more, but um, these are the ones that, uh, that I think it's most important for you to know about. So channel simplification occurs when streams are straightened or channelized to control the flow 
and flooding. And this, what, the picture that we're looking at is actually an irrigation ditch. A lot of these irrigation ditches were once streams that meandered through the, the landscape. And then they carved out the channel and disconnected the stream kind of from its meanders and filled meanders in. Uh, some of these were actually created by people um, where they create a diversion off the streams to create a, a irrigation ditch. So channel simplification can produce a homogeneous channel with the same characteristics throughout the long stretches of stream. It lacks the complexity needed to support diverse wildlife. Riprap dikes and other erosion prevention devices can contribute to channel simplification. And beaver control, which ha has happened for the last 200 years plus, um, also contributes to channel simplification. Beaver are really important ecosystem engineers. They're keystone species, and they have a huge impact on water quality and wildlife habitat. And that was that was about the channel simplification. Um, but there's also the kind of the in-stream habitat, and these are some of the elements of in-stream habitat. It includes logs and log jams, boulders soil, sand and gravel, and rock substrates, tree roots and aquatic plants, and again, those beaver dams. And there are other elements of in-stream habitat, anything that the wildlife rely upon to uh, provide food and shelter inside the streams. So the, the threat that we're looking at here is the loss of in-stream habitat. And we just looked at the channel structure, loss of channel structure, this is loss of in-stream habitat. I'm, I'm combining the two and we'll talk about kind of the, um, the ways that we manage these or, or attempt to fix them at, at the uh, halfway through. So loss of in-stream habitat stems from removal of woody debris, channel dredging, scouring, which removes gravel and sand substrates and which is caused by, um, by stream incision, among other things, and we'll talk more about that later. A sedimentation, which fills in gravel and sand substrates, and sedimentation can also be caused by erosion. Um, and then removal of vegetation and beaver dam removal all decrease the habitat value of the stream. There's a diversity of wildlife that use streams in very different ways. For example, salmon need deep pools of cool water and stream where they can rest shallower gravel bars where they can spawn, side channels that support insects where they can grow, and ripples and rills that add oxygen to the water. Some birds may need vegetation over streams to hunt or hide in, or they may use emergent plants to build nests. They may need shallower water for bathing or deeper water for diving, and even deer need to be able to access the stream from the shoreline. So there's different ways that individual wild or wildlife species access and use the streams, which is why we need a diversity of stream structures. Uh, before we talk about what you can do, let's talk about maybe what you shouldn't do. Um, so good wildlife habitat may not be good for human inhabitants or their neighbors. And this is important, especially if you're in the city. As I said, I, I um, geared this towards some of our urban landowners that might have streams in their backyards. Um, and so what you, <laughs> Do in streams impacts everyone downstream and sometimes upstream from you. It's good to keep in mind sort of the good neighbor rule. Um, it's also important to stay on the right side of the law. And there are laws that strictly regulate what you can and can't do along streams. Um, so some examples of issues are, or some examples of, of wildlife habitat going awry are uh, regular flood, flood waters that may bring nutrients and hunting opportunities to wildlife, but costly repairs to your or your neighbor's house. Um, wood boulders placed in stream will provide shelter for fish, but can also create erosion in new and unexpected places. Planting large trees will give birds a roost and cool waters, but become a safety hazard if they fall on your RV. So talk, talk to your city, your county, and the Department of State Lands before doing any work in or along your stream. And we have some folks from this, the Department of State Lands here today, so hopefully they can chime in a little bit at the end and, and maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, so improving stream channel and in-stream habitat. I started with this part of the presentation because this is the most difficult and most expensive <laughs> part of stream restoration. So it may not be accessible to everybody, especially if you don't have a large um, section of stream. You know, this is the kind of work that watershed councils are frequently doing 
it needs to be engineered. It is very expensive. It frequently these logs and things that you see, they're brought in by giant trucks and put in place with a uh, with cranes. And so this is not a, a cheap backyard fix. <laughs> um, what is your easiest and least expensive option for impacting stream channels and in stream structure is to protect what you have. So before straightening, channelizing streams, um, installing riprap or dikes or removing live or downed trees or boulders, explore other options. See what you can do with what you already have. The more you can keep the complexity in the stream, the roughness they call it, in that stream channel, the, the better off you're going to be and the less likely you are to have to do one of these larger types of projects. Um, if you do elect to change a stream channel or add more structure, you'll need an engineer. Even small changes can have big unintended consequences. Um, a, a single piece of wood in the stream can alter the way the water flows, which can impact the bank further downstream and, and continue to impact the banks further down as the water flows through. So you want to make sure that you know what to expect and, and are keeping on the good side of your neighbors. So are there any questions about that? I went through that pretty quickly. Um, where'd it go? I went through that pretty quickly. Sure, but there if there's no any questions, questions I'd love to Sorry, there were no questions in the chat thus far. Okay, okay. Let me know if you like have any any specifics that you're looking for. All right. So the next threat um, is increased runoff and pollution, and this is water flowing from the sidewalk onto the road, carrying all the dirt, debris, and heavy metals and whatever's on that road directly into the stream system through the drains. Paved surfaces prevent infiltration of surface water, which then carries the pollutants and garbage into our stream systems. In natural areas, like what you might find back here, much of the water infiltrates and is filtered by soil particles and roots as it migrates to the streams. Um, pollutants impact plants, insects, invertebrates, fish, amphibians, and all the species that eat or would have eaten them. Pollutants include, in our area, some of the most important pollutants include fertilizers, pesticides, organic matter, heavy metals, salts, soap, and sediment. So there are a lot of impacts of water pollution. Uh, there are different types of pollution that have many different impacts to diverse species. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about generalization. Fertilizers and organic matter, including fecal matter from manure, pets, or leaky septic tanks, can cause overgrowth of bacteria and algae, increasing water temperatures and depleting dissolved oxygen. This has an oversized impact on side channels and sloughs. Um, those are the areas that support young salmon. And salmon and other aquatic species require dissolved oxygen to breathe. So when, <laughs> when this manure uh, washes into the stream through this, this water here, it can, it can actually kill salmon, among other things. It can, can cause an algal outbreak or an algal growth that can have a huge impact on the stream system. Pesticides and heavy metals from the road runoff that we saw earlier can kill aquatic animals and plants and heavy metals may further accumulate in birds that eat those animals, leading to heavy metal poisoning and eventually death. The, the fish eat the sediments that comes in off the roads. It contains heavy metals. The heavy metals then, uh, or the birds then eat the fish and they aren't able to excrete the heavy metals. And so the heavy metals build up in their system. And then excess sediment from erosion is another form of pollution that can smother invertebrates and fish eggs cloud water to make hunting difficult and lead to increased water temperatures. Sediment can also alter the stream substrate. So as the sediment settles into the, the gravel areas, the gravel bars in our streams, 
it fills in all those little nooks and crannies where a fish eggs and invertebrate egg and vertebrates and eggs live and settle and it smothers them so that we lose diversity in our streams. And then another form of water pollution is thermal pollution. Thermal pollution can be discharged from power plants, dams, wastewater, treatment facilities, and industrial production, uh, runoff from asphalt and paved surfaces, lack of shade to cool waters along streams, um, overgrowth of algae and bacteria on still or slow moving waters can also cause temperature or uh, thermal pollution. And a lack of gravelly substrate and deep pools. I think this is kind of fascinating. As water moves through those sort of shallow gravelly areas on healthy streams, it actually exits those areas much cooler than it went in. So the, the rocks and gravel act as a, a refrigerator for, for the water. And so as, as we lose the gravelly substrate, which we do through scouring, um, frequently caused by uh, inside streams, which we talk about later. Um, it, can, it can cause the water to warm up more. It, you lose that, that refrigeration. And then sedimentation, allowing water to absorb more sunlight in the form of heat is another way that waters are heated up. The impacts of thermal of thermal pollution include reduced dissolved oxygen, which fish and, and um, other aquatic species require, altered chemical properties, um, altered biological processes, and loss of biodiversity. So in the biological processes, uh, a lot of the, uh, the metabolic rate of aquatic organisms changes with the temperature and it can speed up, meaning that those animals need to eat more food in order to stay healthy in the warmer water. So it, it can have a big impact on the creatures that live within the, the water stream. The plants and animals also have a range of temperatures that they're able to live in. So as those waters heat up, we lose a lot of the diversity that was originally there. So improving water quality in your property. One of the best things that you can do is to minimize your use of fertilizers and pesticides. And make sure you fix leaky septic tanks, cover compost and manure piles, prevent erosion. And then you can also do things like installing rain gardens or swales um, and using permeable pavers and planting riparian buffers. We'll talk more about buffers later, but anything that you can do to prevent water from flowing directly into streams. So all of the permeable pavers and the rain gardens and swales are kind of an interruption of that flow of water from the land directly into the streams. And the same is true if you have like downspouts from your gutters that are going directly into streams, if you can find a way to capture that water and allow it to infiltrate so that it can be filtered by soil, it can be filtered by plants before it makes its way into the stream, all of those will have a positive impact on, on the water quality. So are there any questions? And you can speak too, you don't just have to type it into the, into the chat box. Hey, Sarah. Mm -hmm. We do have um, a pretty good kind of observation question. Um, can you speak okay. to uh, how folks talk about collecting rainwater? They say it's illegal in Oregon or in Salem. Can you cover um, rainwater collection and absolutely um, so uh, water that hits the ground is considered um, owned by the state so the department of state lands folks can can speak to that a little bit more potentially if, if they have an opportunity to um, but once it hits the ground it is considered property of the state um, and you can't do anything to impound or hold water 
that has already reached the ground. However, if water is landing on your roof, and this is my understanding, and I, if, if the corrections need to be made, then by all means, let me know. My understanding is that if the water hits like the roof of a barn or a house, and you capture it before it touches the ground, then you're able to hold that uh, and collect that rainwater. And, and you can store that for later use. The issue is in Oregon that um, while you can, we have tons of rain in the winter and you could store a ton of water, you would need a really big storage device to cover <laughs> the droughty periods of the year because we don't get any rain in the summer. If we had regular occasional rain in the summer, you could capture that and use it to water plants and that would um, suffice. But as it is, we basically tend to stop raining sometime maybe in June and don't start raining again until September. And so you need to be able to hold three months worth of, or, or more of water if you wanna use it throughout the summer. So, a, a small rain barrel will last you, you know, a couple waterings maybe. Uh, so you really kind of need a, a really big tank in order to be able to have rainwater collection be very useful in our area. I wish that weren't the case. If we had a little bit more summer rain, it would be a lot easier. Um, but do the folks at Department of State Lands that are present, do any of them have any more thoughts on that subject? Um, so this is Bethany from DSL, and sorry, I was trying to add, get on the chat here real quick, but um, I was just going to say that uh, I think that's more of a water resources department question, and so we we don't necessarily take ownership of, of the water, um, but I believe water resources does, so it's still the state, just a different agency. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and so the SWCD can, if you are interested in doing rainwater collection, um, I would do some research on it first, but the SWCD can assist with that. It's just something to know that, that you, if you want to do rainwater collection, you have to consider getting a really, really large tank for it or a number of really large tanks. Sarah, I just want to let folks reason, know. Go ahead. Laura Schrader, who has law offices that cover just water law. Um, she's worked with us to provide education before and uh, that site is in the chat. So it's really neat. She's also got presentations on there. And then the water resources for Oregon is a great place to go. And Greg Wacker is our water master who seems to have lots of answers to questions like this. Awesome. And Jenny, just to let you know, I can't see the chat at all. For some reason, it won't let me open it up. So let me know if anything else comes up. Are there any other questions? Nope, all clear from, all the, right. chat. from the chat. All right, well then let's talk about erosion. So stream bank erosion occurs when water moves soil, sand, gravel, or rocks downhill or downstream. Erosion is a natural process that is responsible for the valleys and landforms that make up the topography of our world. As I showed you the picture before, we, you know, the streams start at the top, they do, uh, erosion is what creates the, the stream banks and, and so much of our, our um, natural world is, is really created by erosion when it comes down to it. Um, however, excess stream bank erosion is caused by humans at a rate 10 to 15 times faster than any natural process. So in our view, anything that we can do to slow or stop erosion is gonna be really important because we are, we are creating it at a much faster rate than the natural world would. Um, and erosion moves fertile topsoil from yards and farms into streams, leaving behind gullies and denuded soils. And those soils then move downstream, they become, a, instead of being an asset, they become a pollutant, and then they um, deposit in areas where they um, become problematic. The impacts of erosion in areas, or sorry, erosion impacts riparian areas in a number of ways. 
Erosion carries sediment and runoff from yards farm and farms to streams, impacting water quality. Large amounts of soil are deposited at the mouths of streams and rivers, creating shallower channels, which may then need to be dredged. Um, damage to yards, gardens, and buildings can result from unchecked erosion, like you can see in this picture. And after it starts, erosion can be difficult to manage. Erosion creates incised streams, which we're going to um, talk about next. But the difficult to manage, you can see in this picture, the stream is way down at the bottom, and the, the stream bank is way up at the top where, that gra where the grass is. And once the stream has reached down there, there's almost no way to prevent further erosion without some really um, big projects. <laughs> If you can stop the erosion when you start to see it, you can have a much bigger impact and you can really prevent this kind of issue from happening. Incised streams are streams which have eroded downward from the stream banks. Incision creates a steep drop along the edge of the water. You can see the, the drop here. Um, and the drops are more inclined to erode further. You can see in this particular stream, the stream has eroded down past the level of where all the roots reach. And so there's nothing really holding that soil further down. So that creates even more erosion. Um, the interesting thing to me is that as the stream incises, as it drops and continues to erode downward, the water level actually also drops. And so the The surrounding vegetation may require more irrigation than it did before. You can see how those roots that we're looking at are no longer reaching the water table down there. And so you end, can end up with a much drier upland as that water moves down through the soil. The other thing that happens with these incised streams is that uh, during floods, the, the water can no longer move out over the floodplain. And so all of that energy and all that large amounts of water roar through this channel right here. And they, they push the, or they continue to erode away downward. So it makes the problem worse. They also scour the bottom of that channel, moving a lot of the gravels and kind of the finer sediment downstream. And you end up with a, another simplified channel from that. And then inside is incised streams are common, especially where, and as you look at this picture, it's, it, it's definitely like this, where the vegetation has been removed along the stream bank and all those root systems are no longer in place to hold that soil. It's a really difficult problem to fix because once it starts, it only makes itself worse. And the way that they, the, what they do is to fix this problem is called floodplain reconnection. It's, it's done typically on a very large scale. It involves creating a shallow channel elsewhere and then redirecting the water into the shallow channel and then potentially filling in the old channel. It's a, a big, big project to take on, but it can have a, have a positive impact on, on these sort of stream systems. The main thing to take away from this is don't let your stream get to this place in the this point in the first place. So prevention is key. And keep or plant healthy riparian vegetation along your streams. Regrade stream banks before planting if needed and permitted. So that means you go in with um, some machinery and instead of having instead of having this steep hill right here, you can make it a, a much uh, make it not as steep and then you can plant that uh, to stabilize the soils and that'll help you to create some stabilization in that channel. The other thing is to slow the movement of water. Fast water causes more erosion so the more that you can slow the movement of water the better. Um, and then we talked about reconnecting floodplains. And riprap and dikes should only be considered as a last resort. So if your house is being threatened by erosion, then you might consider riprap's and dikes, but they should always be engineered. 
Are there any questions on erosion? Yes, Sarah. Nancy was asking what plants you would recommend for the bare walls of that incised stream, not towards the top of the bank, but something that you could put in <laughs> to reduce that erosion. That is an incredibly difficult question to answer. So there is a, <laughs> there is a, we're going to talk about plants a little bit later. Um, there's not a lot of things that will grow on a vertical surface like that and the process of planting into a vertical surface uh, can actually make the problem worse because you're digging into the side of this, this stream bank and then when the water comes up, it can, it can find that disturbed area and, and sort of create more erosion along there. Um, as I say, a lot of times, depending on the situation, we might consider regrading that that area so that it's not as steep and then you would be able to plant into that a lot of times too but we'll if we do that we might lay down a quar mat or some sort of biodegradable cloth um, that will hold soil in place while plants get established um, but planting directly into that cliff face there there's not a lot that's going to grow there you might be able to get um uh, sword ferns and maybe snowberries to grow. I would keep it small because any large plant is going to increase erosion by becoming top heavy. And, you know, since it only has kind of half of the ground to dig into that, that makes it more likely to fall over. So, and that, that then increases the erosion. So it's, it's really difficult to deal with those steep banks once they, they've been created. Um, one thing that I, I would keep in mind would be slowing the water as much as possible once you have those. And that may include planting things even in the water column itself, depending. Um, you might be able to plant like willows or spirea is a good one for holding soil. Um, and, and really keeping those slopes from further eroding and maybe not replanting that, that very, steep part of it. If you can't regrade, you may not be able to plant that part of it, but you may want to plant at the top and the bottom. Any other questions? Does that make sense? We had, um, we had said, Nancy had mentioned, yes, she had sword ferns naturally filling in. And then uh, Bethany added the willows and sedges are good for holding banks together due to their root system, which sedges are fantastic. And I agree. Thanks for agree. adding. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say if this was my stream, I would probably consider um, planting some sedges or, or, or the willows or, or something right kind of along that, that base of that cliff area. And then again, something up near the top that's drought tolerant. And those sword ferns are pretty drought tolerant. So I might do some of those up here and, uh, and maybe not mess with that steep bank at all because you can create more erosion there. All right, so the next threat that I want to talk about is invasive plants. And this one's near and dear to me. I used to be an invasive plant specialist um, when I lived in the Portland area. So I love to geek out about plants. Um, an invasive plant or an invasive species is any plant or animal that is not native to an ecosystem and causes harm to the environment. So there's lots of plants that are in the environment that are not native to here, but they don't cause any harm. They may not spread very much or they may not push out other plants or um, they just don't cause issues. An invasive plant is one that actually causes harm, whether it's to the environment, the economy, livestock, human health, um, there's actually a, a harmful impact to it. And we have lots of invasive species in our area. This is just a short list of ones that you might be aware of. Um, are familiar with, or maybe not. And what we're looking at here is not a uh, knotweed infestation. It, can, it grows incredibly dense, and you can see how there's nothing else growing in that infestation except the knotweed. Um, most common in our area are probably Himalayan blackberry and reed canary grass. Uh, both of those are, are 
all over the place <laughs> along our streams. And then uh, shining geranium is another issue. It's a, it's a little annual that doesn't have much of a root system, but can take over an area. And since it doesn't have much of a root system, it's not good at holding soil from erosion. So it can increase the erosion along the stream. And then there's also English ivy, yellow flag iris, poison hemlock, and many others. If you have plants along your stream that you think are invasive or might be invasive or you need identification help, or if you have native plants too, um, you can either invite me out for a site visit or you can send me a few good pictures. And this is open to everyone. You don't have to be working with the district or you know, this is open to partner organizations. Anyone that, that needs plant identification help, you can text me a few good pictures um, and I'll see if I can tell you what it is. I don't know everything, but I know a, a fair number. So, um, the impacts of invasive species are huge. Invasive species prevent the establishment of native plants. If we're looking at this picture here, uh, a seed from an elderberry or a big leaf maple that might fall in here is probably not going to get started because the overstory um, vegetation is so dense that they wouldn't be able to grow in here. Um, the invasive species can form monocultures, or in this case, it looks a little bit more like a biculture. This is reed canary grass and blackberries and not much else in here. Um, and, and those, you know, simplify the ecosystem and get rid of or destroy wildlife habitat and, and really they can cause erosion and things like that. Um, some of invasive plants are allelopathic, which means that they put toxins in the soil that kill off other plants. A really good example is called garlic mustard. And while we don't have it yet in Marion County that we know of, it's uh, popping up all over the place up in Portland. And it's this incredibly innocent looking little green forb with white flowers that pops up, but it's very allelopathic. And so it can form these dense monocultures understory under the forest floor and, and literally kill all of the other plants except the shrubs and trees. And so it kills off the entire understory and all you have is garlic mustard. It's a huge problem on the East Coast and it's becoming more and more of a problem here as something to keep our eyes open for. But there are a lot of other ways that, that um, plants or other plants that are allelopathic and other ways that plants impact the ecosystem around them. Um, and as I said, invasive plants can increase erosion um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on this next slide. So in a natural ecosystem, a natu natural stream riparian area, you have a diversity of plants, a bunch of different types of plants, and those different types of plants have different root systems. Some are short and net-like, some are long, um, some don't have, have a lot of branches and some have many, many branches. And it's this diversity of root systems that kind of weave together to help protect that soil from, from being washed away. And when you have a monoculture, you end up with only one type of root system in that, in that area. And so the soil isn't held nearly as well. And you can see this in blackberry patches where we remove the blackberries and suddenly you see these big erosive rills underneath where the blackberries had been. The blackberries do a really good job of hiding the erosion that they cause um, because there's that lack of, of diverse root systems. And then managing invasive plants. Uh, we can talk about what you can do for these. Um, again, prevention is key. Prevention is the most important thing. Um, and the best way to prevent invasive plants is by keeping healthy streamside vegetation. So most of our invasive plants don't like shade. If you can produce a lot of shade along your streams, you're going to have a lot less maintenance issues. Um, blackberries may survive underneath a forest canopy, but they aren't nearly as aggressive. They allow other plants to grow as well. There are some need invasive plants that proliferate under, under shade. And as I say, garlic mustard was one of them. Hopefully we don't have any in our district. Um, but another one is, is that shiny geranium. It can grow under story. But for the most part, that, that keeping that healthy 
strong stream side vegetation is going to help you out with managing invasive plants. Um, so each individual plant um, or individual species has times when they are most susceptible to management practices. And they might have, if you're using herbicides, they might have herbicides that they're most susceptible to at, at particular times of year. Even if you aren't using herbicides, if you're using manual controls, there might be times of year when it's, it's best and times of year when it's not as effective. And so managing infestations using best management practices is key to really getting control and putting in the least amount of effort and money and herbicide as possible. If you have questions on best management practices for specific species, we're happy to share that. We have a ton of that information to give you um, to help you plan your, your management practices. Um, if you're using herbicide near streams, we always recommend using aquatic formulations and aquatic certified applicators. Again, anything you do in your stream impacts everybody downstream from you. So make sure that you're using, and all of the, not just your human neighbors, but all of your, um, all of your aquatic neighbors as well. So you wanna make sure you're using the right chemicals. Uh, we like to minimize digging and disturbance along stream banks, because again, that can increase erosion. Um, it can also, disturbance, a lot of our invasive plants really thrive in disturbance. There's a, a lot of seed in the soil and so if you disturb areas along the stream banks, you're likely to have invasive plants popping up to fill in those areas. Blackberries especially bad about this. So, so minimize digging and disturbance along stream banks. However, if you're doing manual control methods and you don't want to use herbicides along your stream banks, that's totally understandable. There may be ways to either minimize the amount of disturbance you do in your, um, in your vegetation management. You can also, as I said, you can use coir mats or, or like a natural cloth to, um, to kind of cover disturbed areas so they, they aren't as prone to erosion and, and reinfestation. And then most important, replant with, invasive, with native plants. If you remove a bunch of invasive plants from your stream side or anywhere on your property, you're gonna have a big empty space and an empty space will just fill in with weeds again. Um, so make sure you replant with native plants. It's, it's the key to, to keeping all of the, yeah, to, to keeping the area healthy. Um, and then on that note, I wanted to talk a little bit about buffers. This is the riparian buffer. This is the forest buffer. I have probably the best kind of buffer because it provides lots of big shade, uh, helps to cool the stream channels, it holds soil, it prevents runoff from the fields from entering into that stream, and, um, and it's a really effective way to protect our streams. There are a number of types of buffers. This, as I say, this is the forest buffer. I've also helped people to put in shrub buffers in agricultural areas where they didn't want the tall trees to impact their, um, their crops. And they also wanted pollinator habitat. And so the, planting a variety of native shrubs can also help to kind of hold that soil and provide habitat for birds and pollinators and all the other wildlife. I've even worked um, with, a, with a golf course who wanted to keep the line of sight open, but they wanted to plant a buffer along their streams. And we ended up creating a um, buffer of sedges along the streams that stay fairly low growing and help protect that stream from inputs from, you know, the fertilization of the grass and things uh, and, and any like pesticides they might use as well as holding the soil from erosion. So you can, buffers come in all shapes and sizes. A lot of folks will tell you 35 or 55 feet is the bet from the edge of the stream is the best buffer width, but as much vegetation as you can put along a stream, it's going to make your stream healthier. And then when you're creating a buffer, there's a few things to think about for sure. Um, the first thing is to know your site. If you have sun or shade, if you have a moist soil, if you dry out a lot in the summer, um, or if you have a regular flood regime, all of that is important to know so that you know what types of plants 
you can put in. Um, and then as you're creating a buffer, you want to create diversity, um, plant more species to provide those diverse root systems and create diverse food and shelter opportunities for wildlife. And then along the streams, we like to plant very densely. Um, dense plantings will keep pollutants and sediments from entering the channel. It'll, it'll, it'll hold that, that soil better. And it'll make it so you have less maintenance to do in the short term. Uh, the other thing you can do if you're planting a forest buffer kind of right along the stream is right outside of that forest buffer, you may be able to put in a shorter, uh, like a grass buffer to help filter out that sediment and that, that fertilizer and, and things that are trying to come into that, that stream system. So as, as much as you can planting densely and keeping healthy vegetation along the side of the stream. Um, and then the last thing that I wanna say uh, is to make sure, if you look in the upper left-hand corner here, you'll see a little bench, a little path. Make sure when you're planning your riparian buffer that you create spaces for humans to interact with the stream. If, if you're planting along the stream side, you wanna leave a few openings where people can see water. And if you, you know, if you have a picnic table, you can create an opening for picnic tables, you can create paths through the area, but the more you interact with your stream, the more likely you are to protect it. All right, continue on. We've got native plants for stream size. There's a million native plants. And I have in our resources section, I have an, a link to an awesome, uh, Using Willamette Valley native plants along your stream, it talks about what plants to plant where, and it's a fantastic little booklet for you. Um, but some of the trees that, that we have along our streams include willows, red alders, Oregon crabapple, big leaf maple, red cedar, and even Oregon white oak and Willamette ponderosa pine. Those two seem like drier species, but they actually will grow along the stream sides, depending on the stream side. And then we have some great shrubs like the beautiful Pacific nine, nine bark and mock orange, ocean spray, service berry, which has delicious berries for you and for the birds. Um, cascara and vine maple are also excellent options. And there's also a million forbs that you can use like lupins and syncopoil and piggyback plant, camas and sluice edge and bulrushes. And so there's, there's really, if you have a small property along a stream side, you, there's a great, you have a great opportunity to plant native plants and to make a beautiful area along your streams. So resources, the next two slides have resources. I can copy these and send them to you in, in an email if you'd like. Um, we've got a, a, several handouts. There's a streamside landowners in Multnomah County, or tips for streamside landowners. That one's from Multnomah County, but it's good for folks here as well. There's not a lot of difference between Multnomah County and, and Marion County ultimately. Um, and then the native plant guide, the Using Willamette Valley Native Plants is an excellent um, booklet. Uh, streams and riparian areas from OSU. OSU put out a really good one that can help you assess the health of your stream. And then moving on, other resources include Marion Soil and Water Conservation District. We are here to help you with site evaluations, project planning and project funding. Um, and we have lots of opportunities to assist you in whatever way you need assistance. So let us know if, as I say, if you need plant ID or if you wanna know what kind of projects you can install and if you want the financial assistance to, to put, install a project, then come talk to us. Watershed councils. So everyone, most of us live in an area that's covered by one of the watershed councils. Um, and the watershed councils may be able to assist also with site evaluations, project planning, and project funding. Their funding sources are usually through a web or another uh, granting agency. And so you can contact your local watershed council and get a ton of information from them. Uh, the city of Salem has a watershed protection and preservation grants and they provide free trees for along waterways. And so uh, here's a link to kind of the Watershed Protection and Preservation Grant um, website. It's a great program. Um, and for folks, if, if there's anyone out there in the Salem area that has 
knotweed on their property within Salem city limits. There's a, a free program. They're treating knotweed for, I think the, like the fourth year or something of that sort um, for free on folks' property. It's, it's definitely a plant that they wanna keep from moving or, or growing in, in the area. So, and then Marion County also has a water pollution reporting form online. So if you see concerns and don't know where to turn, um, check out this, this website. 